When you have narrow pieces, you know, 15 and a quarter, 12 inches, whatever, it's not safe to cross cut using a rip fence. And most people know that, but I do see, unfortunately, some people using the rip fence to cross cut little pieces, little narrow pieces. Um, it can get a little bit frightening because if your piece moves at all as you're cutting it, it's gonna kick back and there's really not much you could do to prevent it. Um, so what I recommend is if you're, if you're cutting pieces that are, you know, I would say, you know, depending on how long they are, I would say probably eight, 12 inches, 10 inches. Um, I, I, and unless they're really short, I would say never do that. Um, this is 15 inches. I would feel comfortable cutting this if it was maybe like 20 inches long, which would be about here. That would be fine. Um, I might even go maybe even a little longer than that. It probably would be okay. But after that, you know, after about 25, you know, 30 inches long, it's going to get a little bit scary. So what I would recommend is trying to use a, um, a sled of some sort. Now you guys have seen, the video that I did on my sled and it's it's one of those videos that I think you know you should watch because you'll understand the benefits of using it but here's one I'm going to be cutting this 92 and a half inches long and this is 15 and a quarter wide so 92 and a half inches long obviously that's going to be a very big cut so how else do you cut this right you can't really cut this efficiently any other way than having this kind of a setup. You could have a sled, maybe it's not as big as this, that would still work, but even with a big sled like this, I still have to have this guy here because this guy is gonna help me support, you know, I've got this entire table here, which another thing, if you're doing, you know, any kind of a, um, a shop design, think about having side support, not just outfit support. I see this a lot too, where people are trying to set up their shop and they, and they kind of think all they need is outfeed support. Well, I want to encourage more people to look at the side support as well. And because without this side support, I would have nothing here to support this piece. So I think that that's really important to have, but also this extension for the um, sled. So this is kind of like an outfeed support. Um, for the table saw, it's an outfeed support for the sled. So as I push the piece through, it holds it from falling down. And even though I have this table, my sled is raised up. And you don't want to have any pressure lifting up as you're push, pushing this through. You want this whole piece to be nice and stable and not tipping. So having this here is really good. Now, obviously, if you don't have any support down there, you know, if you don't have this table here, then you don't really have this ability to have this. Instead, what I would do is have a, a roller of some sort to help me, or maybe make a, um, like a sawhorse type of a situation where you've got a, a sawhorse like this that's holding it. Um, if you haven't used these sleds before, there's, there's some tricks to learning how to use them. What you don't want to do is you don't want to assume that it's going to be rigid enough to pull it back and forth with one hand. I never do that because I'm in both slots and I want to make sure that I have steady pressure from both sides as I push this through. I don't want to just, just like you wouldn't open up a drawer with one hand if you have two poles, you know, on the right and left, you wouldn't just use the right pole to open up a drawer. It's not going to open up properly. You need to have both hands pulling on those knobs equally. It's the same with this. You want to have pressure from both sides so that you can push through evenly. And then when you come back, you want to also come back evenly. Well, what I do when I come back is I pull my material up against the fence. And as I do that, I take my other hand and I pull it back. So now I've got both hands pulling towards me evenly. So now I've got 
even force coming back to me. And when you pull it back, it's important to move the material away from the saw blade. So as, you're, as you cut it through, you know, you complete the cut, you don't want to have the material bind on the saw blade when it comes back. So I want to take my material and I want to move it out of the way just a little bit, grab it, and then pull back evenly. That makes it nice and neat. What's going to happen if, you, if you're if um, you grabbing it from one side and yanking it down or vice versa? Wh what's going to happen ultimately are your um, your slides that you have and your, um, your miter slots, those are going to wear. You're going to probably end up bending them or something. It's going to have a lot of pressure on them. So um, you don't want to do that. The screws will start to get loose and then those um, runners will start to um, have movement in them. And once they have movement, you know, you're done. So um, let's try really hard not to pull back with um, one hand. And if you do do with one hand, sometimes I could use this guy or I could use this block here but I'm still providing pressure from my left side because this guy here, if I don't hold on to my material and I pull back, my material is just gonna stay back because it's literally you know, on that guy, so it's kind of just gonna sit there. I need to pull it back at the same time. Now, if you do find yourself in a situation where you can move this with one hand, if you have a smaller slide or um, you know whatever, perhaps you're using in just one um, runner and not two. If you just have one runner in this, then uh, it, it might be possible to pull it back. But I find with two, uh, I, I want it to be solid coming back to me and going forward. Okay. Now, when you're pushing it forward into the cut, what you want to do also is make sure that you maintain contact with your fence on both sides because as you push this through if I don't squeeze this towards the fence it's just gonna watch what happens to the piece as I move it you see what it does it goes like that so what's happening is it's coming away from the fence because I have no pressure here I don't want that to happen so I have to put pressure against the fence and down which is why these gloves I mean, I, you got to use these things. They're going to give you grip. And you have a little bit of grip, and it provides that force towards the fence. And now I can go ahead and push this guy right through the cut. Once you get done with the cut, push it all the way through and make sure that the blade does not show here. Um, if you're bottoming out before the blade is completely buried, you can um, make your make these slots longer because perhaps you're hitting those slots. But whatever the case is, you want to make sure that when you push this through, you don't see any of the blade when it's going in here. You want it completely covered. And if you use a stop, let's say, and the piece is right in here, you never, ever, ever want to pull that back with the piece wedged between the blade and the stop. Don't ever do that. So many times I see um, people make these cuts and then they bring it back with this still in place. So two things are gonna happen. One is you could hurt your cut, right, on either piece, because if the saw blade is, is uh, spitting and you're in contact with the wood, even though it was just cut, I don't care. It's going to damage the piece or you're going to get kicked back. And I'm going to tell you something. If this thing kicks back when you're pulling it back, it isn't going to be very pretty piece. So I'm going to make a bunch of cuts here and I will show you what I'm talking about. Okay. Now for the first one, what I'm going to do is this, because this is a 92 and a half long piece, I need to cut this off and I only have a few inches right because this is a 97 um, inch long piece I only have you know give or take five inches of scrap so I'm going to cut a couple inches off of this and then I need to flip this whole thing over and measure from that side up 
and then to 92 and a half, and then I can put it at my saw kerf and make that cut. So I'm gonna do that. First thing is to square up this edge. Now because this piece, I'm cutting, um, I'm making it almost the whole length of this piece, I don't have much room. So I'm gonna do just a couple inches here. So that makes it extra difficult to hold. So I'm gonna take it really hard and squeeze it to the fence. And I don't have any material here to hold, but I can start, if you need to, you can start holding it, but then remove your hand, okay? Obviously you don't want your hand anywhere near the cut. And whatever you do, don't stop the cut when you're doing it. Make the cut complete. If you stop the cut, you're gonna get a mark in your workpiece. And if you don't cut all the way through completely, you're gonna get a mark in your workpiece. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead, turn my dust collector on. And this is another reason why I like this overhead guard, because it keeps the piece from tipping. Isn't that cool? Okay, so I want to show you something. You saw when I completed that cut, when I went through it, right, I took my piece after it was done being cut, and I was done with the cut, just like that, and rather than pulling it back, keeping this guy in place, I took it and moved it to the side. But you also saw that I did I didn't take the piece, that little strip here, I let that one stay as I pulled it back. And the reason is, is that this was a scrap piece that I let stay there, and it wasn't pinned in with the stop. So again, if you don't have a stop, and the piece, let's say, is a scrap piece, right, which is what it would be, um, like let's say I square up that, that edge right there, uh, I, I can cut that, and I don't have to worry about this piece getting pinned in the, play, the blade. So I can pull it back. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So I'll fire up the saw. Okay, here's what I'm talking about. So right now I've got these two pieces that are right there and the blade would theoretically be in between them, right? The blade is not visible, right? It's completely buried. So as you can see, my splitter is the only thing that's visible. Now, the splitter, when I use the splitter in this situation is really good because I make sure that that guy is gonna keep the um, work piece from going into the blade. So that's a really nice thing to keep your splitter in when you're using a crosscut sled. But you notice that this piece is free to move. There's nothing pinning it in. So the saw blade isn't gonna do anything for, to it, okay? Now, this is a scrap, this is gonna be waste, right? So this is gonna go into the trash, which is why it doesn't matter if it gets touched by the saw blade. This is the work piece. I wanna make sure I move that out of the way when I slide the, the um, fence back, okay? So I can pull this back 
and you can see right there, that's my kerf. As I pull this guy back, you're going to see the saw blade appear. And remember, when the saw blade appears, right, you want that blade to be completely buried after you're done with the cut. So watch this blade. It gets completely buried. There it goes. So now it's completely gone. And again, that, that splitter is there. Keeps me from, you know, a lot of bad things happening. Those splitters are really cool. And again, remember, this is the piece that I want to, to be good. So this is the one I'm going to go ahead and remove. Move that to the side. This one I can leave because it's not going to do anything. I could sit here, um, you know, pull this back all day long and nothing would happen to this piece. It's not going to do anything when the um, blade is going. Nothing's going to happen to that guy. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I'll turn the saw on and with the dust collector and I'll show you. I'm going to go ahead and scrap that. Now I'm going to go ahead and I think that'll be better for illustration purposes. Let me go ahead and remove that. And then Did you see how safe that was to bring that back? No problems whatsoever. Now, if I have a stop there and I complete the cut, I have to move this away from the blade and out of the way because if it's pinned in between the stop and the blade, then something can happen to it. So that you got the blade, the stop, and the workpiece. The workpiece is literally pinned in there and any movement could cause this to essentially going to push back towards me but without the stop there it's free to move so there's no pressure on it the thing can you know move like that and it's not going to hurt anything wide enough so that they don't, you know, do that when you push them through. If it doesn't skew as you're pushing them through. So if you're doing like wide pieces, let's say for instance this guy right here. So this is 15 and a quarter or something, and the piece is 31 inches long. Now, if I were to take this, and my rip fence is set at 30, this piece is totally doable to cut like this with the rip fence. Now, 15 and a quarter cut in 30 inches is not bad, but that's because this piece is only 31 inches long, so I'm only cutting an inch off of it. If this piece was eight foot long, you know, going all the way out here, now all of a sudden I have a bigger piece and that makes it even narrower to work with. And as I push this through, the goal is to put pressure here but you have all this over here. So naturally you're going to want to put a hand here and a hand here, and that's going to make it not terribly scary, but a little bit shaky. Um, and that's 15 inches. As you get narrower, like some of them were 12 inches, uh, it becomes really scary to uh, cross cut like this. And um, this is only 30 inches long. Imagine going out beyond that. So I would say if you're looking at this video and you're watching this, and you're wondering, you know, what's the safest point at which I can cross cut with my rip fence? How narrow can it be? Again, that's going to be your comfort level, but I'm going to tell you that I wouldn't do anything, you know, I would say that 12 to 14 inches would be kind of like that iffy range. And again, it depends on how long it is. So sometimes it's nice to rough cut things um, to length so that you have about an inch le left over. 
so that you can manage it like this. So this is much easier to deal with. I can push this through, absolutely no problem whatsoever. Another thing is have a splitter in place. If you have a splitter in place, it's really gonna keep that piece. It's gonna help it not do this as you're pushing it through. And keep pressure here. Just remember that whenever a, um, a piece of wood is gonna kick back at you, it's gonna kick back at you in this side. So if you're all the way over here, obviously nothing's gonna get kicked back at you. But there's no way that you could push this through and be over here at the same time. It isn't just, it's not gonna work. You need to have more pressure here. So being over here is just not realistic like this, um, certainly. But you need to be in this area. Just understand that if the wood's gonna kick back, it's gonna come back at you like that. So it's like, it's kind of like one of those things do um, at your own risk. Um, so I would say if when in doubt, try to make some sort of a sled uh, it, or use a, uh, a different tool. If you don't have a sled or if you can't make one, but if you're getting like narrow pieces, like 12 inches or so, obviously if you had a long miter gauge with a, you know, a long fence on it, that would be helpful, but it's not, those aren't ideal for bigger pieces, certainly cabinet stuff, uh, but you know, for hardwood, you know, that's reasonable. Also, if it's less than 12 inches, you might consider using the sliding compound miter saw that has about 12 inch capacity on it. Just understand that you're not going to get the same quality of cut. Uh, it's probably not going to be as square as this. Um, it's just, you know, as they, the sliding saws come out, they're not as rigid and you tend to have a little bit of flex. Um, you know, in my experience. So they may not be the most accurate. Um, okay. So if you're, um, if you're just starting with the table saw and you're wondering what, what should you make first as an accessory, I would encourage you to make a, uh, some sort of a sled. And, um, you know, that's probably going to be one of the smartest things you can do. I understand that when you first start out, you're not going to know what you you know, you don't know what you don't know. So if you're having problems deciding like how to make a sled, you know, watch obviously YouTube videos, um, but understand that um, your first sled's probably not gonna be your best sled, but it's going to be something that's gonna get you, you know, to that next level, and it's gonna give you practice uh, on the um, table saw. And um, obviously if you have any issues with using a table saw safely, you can always use like a, a track saw or a, a skill saw, uh, but um, you know, whatever the case is, if you're in your head thinking you shouldn't be making this cut because maybe it doesn't feel very stable, I'm gonna tell you right now, don't do it because as soon as you start thinking you're, that it seems a little shaky, it probably is a little shaky and you probably shouldn't do it. Uh, that's for sure. Now I've only encountered kickback, uh, experienced it one time myself and that was uh, when I first had one of my contractor saws. And the contractor saw, um, the fence was pinching the blade a little bit, and I didn't have a splitter at all. Uh, I had no riving knife, no splitter, no nothing, just a blade. And you know what? It, it was one of those things where I was ripping a thin strip, and I was ripping it, and everything was fine. The problem is, is that when I was ripping it, I was kind of new, right? I hadn't been using the table saw that often. So I was, you know, I maybe had it for a year, maybe. And as I was, um, this is back in 1999, 1998, something around there. And I was using it and I forgot one important thing. And that is to never leave the blade. I mean, never, never leave the um, workpiece pinned between the blade and the fence. So as I pushed this through, I grabbed the piece here and moved it away, but I forgot about that thin strip and it was only a, like a one eighth inch thin strip and my push block, right? I left my push block and the piece of wood was still there. That thing fired back and it actually went the length of my two car tandem garage. And I was in a condo and it was two cars deep. It actually flew back so fast, I had no idea what happened. I looked behind me, I didn't know where this piece of wood was. So I go 
all the way to the front of the garage. And guess what I see? I see this piece of wood sticking through the garage door, almost 50 feet deep. It flew and penetrated the garage door and stuck out like that. So it was sticking and we, this wasn't our house, this was a rental. So now I have this thing in my, you know, I had a hole in my garage door that wasn't even my door, a steel garage door. So word of, word of caution, if you ever are considering um, making a cut, make sure you think about it completely. Don't ever leave a, a, a work piece in between the fence and the blade. And if you ever can help it, always use a splitter. It's really going to help. If I had a splitter in place, that would not have happened. Uh, but uh, that you know, splitters were a pain, right? Because they were the, the the big guard, and you couldn't get your fence close to it. So I didn't even bother with splitters, and um, it didn't you know, it, it wasn't something I ever used. But after that situation, I always will remember, never leave something stuck in between there. And uh, even with my splitter, I still won't do it, but that's just there, just in case, right? Uh, and it makes it a lot safer. I just wanted to tell you that because it, it can happen, um, and, it's, and it's in a blink of an eye before you even know it. So make sure, there's two things to make sure. One is that your fence is parallel with the blade, and I'm not talking about, it can't pinch the blade at all. If anything, you want it to toe out just a little bit. So if there's any kind of difference, you want this to be pointing away from the saw blade. I mean, a minute amount. But uh, other than that, that's it. So I just wanted to show you that, and I'm just gonna continue on with all my um, datas. Now that all these pieces are cut.